Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome once again to Richard Skipper Celebrates. I am very excited to be back today. I was out all week last week uh, with an ear infection, uh, but I'm proud to say that I'm on the mend and everything is going great. Um, I want to take a moment to pause to think about all the people out there who are dealing with COVID. It's been 215 days since our theaters shut down. But thank God for the internet and thank God that we can all come together and we can celebrate each other. And that's what my show is about. It's celebrating artists and their body of worth. And I am very excited today because I'm going to be celebrating two artists. Yes, two. The first, of course, is Joy Lansing. I have been a fan of Joy Lansing since I first saw her on the Beverly Hillbillies uh, as Gladys Flat. That was my introduction to her. And for a lot of people, their introduction to her was also through television. And our guest today, Alexis Hunter, had a very special bond and relationship with Joy Lansing, and I am so excited. This is an interview that we have been trying to set up for quite some time. And Alexis, here we are finally together. How are you? Um, I'm doing great, Richard. How are you? I'm doing fine. I first interviewed you for my blog, I think it was about four years ago. Yes, yeah, yeah, right and after the book came out. Right after the book came out. And yeah. we never have really said, this is the first time that we're actually coming face to face with each other. Oh, I love it. I love it, Richard. So before we talk about Joy and her legacy and uh, this wonderful book, which I want to recommend to everyone, and I'm going to put my little ticker on so that everybody can order the book. Oh. And I'm sure that after today's show, you're all going to want to order the book. There it is, Joy Lansing, A Body to Die For. There are so many layers to this book. But before we get there, I want to ask how you're doing, really, I'm, in the I'm, midst of all this world that we're living in right now. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. I mean, it's been stressful for just about everybody. And I had uh, a pretty serious surgery a, a couple of months ago. So I'm just recuperating, but I'm doing okay. Well, you look great. And that's the good thing. <laughs> 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 well, it's not how you feel, it's how you look, of course. So um, I want to go back and I want to talk a little bit about the trajectory of your career before we get to Joy. I know that you were born in Kansas. Can you tell me a little bit about what your life was like in Kansas with your family, brothers and sisters? A lot of this is in the book, but you can share this with everyone. Yeah, uh, I had one sister, uh, five years younger. Her name was Susie. Wonderful. And uh, Kansas is a great place to live. It's a great place to grow up, but it's pretty boring. <laughs> it's not like <laughs> California. It's, 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 it's okay. Um, and then I moved out here just as I was going into my senior year of high school. But, you know, getting back to Kansas for a moment, growing up there, what were your aspirations growing up? What did you uh, imagine your life being? And were you always wanting to go into show business? Um, yeah, I think that was always in the background. I always thought that would be great fun. And uh, when I was in high school, I was in the drama club and uh, and uh, I loved it. I loved it. I love doing plays and acting and doing readings. And was so, there a lot of art in your home growing up? I uh, mean, not, theater not, and no, not at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of an anomaly because there was no art. Um, well, you and I have that in common. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. Yeah, but there was nothing. It's interesting because when people, I grew up in South Carolina. And when we, if somehow something happens in our lives that the spark goes through us and we say, this is the life that we want to live. Um, for me, 
I chose New York. You chose Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want to go into film as opposed to doing stage work? Uh, yeah, I wanted to do film. I was going to be a superstar. I had decided that. And uh, and uh, being in that fabulous film where I met Joy, I thought would give me the great opportunity. Well, let's talk about that film. <laughs> First of all, you watching, you know, um, you live in Palm Springs, am I correct? Right, right. And one of my dearest friends, you know, who passed away a few years ago was Carol Channing. Oh. And I used to watch her on television, uh, never imagining that someday we would become friends. I would stay in her home. Um, oh my God. Your relationship with Joy goes a little bit deeper than that. Uh, we'll yeah, there. yeah, uh, just a little bit, yeah. But you first saw her uh, when you saw her on the Bob Cummings show. Right, when um, I was a kid, yeah. And what was it about Joy Lansing with that this attraction was oh my so God. intense? Yeah, when I was a kid, I would rush home from school to watch her on Bob Cummings. I just thought she was just, just the most magnificent uh, person I had ever seen in my life, and I was just fascinated with her. So, I mean, this is all just like a, a fairy tale. So you go to you go to Hollywood. You have mm -hmm. a roommate uh, who was working on this film, uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I have to ask you, before we talk about the film, when was the last time you saw the film? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, the, the, the first and the last time I saw it was, Joy and I went to see just a screening of it um, in a small theater and it was so bad. It was so stinko that we just- we, I know that Joy, you say, Joy said, this we is left. the worst film that I've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was humiliating. <laughs> so, so for those of you who don't know, and of course this is all in the book, uh, in vivid detail, I might add. Oh um, my god! You were cast to be in the movie Bigfoot. Absolutely, and I was a Bigfoot. Uh, my friend Alicia um, is the one who had the part originally, and she called me. She says, "I cannot bear being in this <laughs> monkey suit." one minute longer do you want the gig and i said sure so uh she took me to meet the producer and director and i got the job yay and uh, i knew i was set this was going to be it and 1969 um, in 1969 i mean i was i had just turned 21 so uh this was a big deal for me and this was my first big break and so there, there I am uh, in the monkey suit, and uh, that was the beginning, Richard. So there you are. You are covered in fur. Uh -huh. uh, as you say in the book, the fur is actually peeling off of your face because the light yes. is so intense. Yeah, because they glued it on. This was such a low-budget, stinkle <laughs> film. <laughs> then, uh, they uh, glued it on, and then they put, like, black spray paint on my face. I mean, this was awful and on my hands and they glued hair on my hands and then I was in this stupid monkey suit and uh, I was a fright, absolute fright, but uh, but it worked, it worked for me. So. And in the trajectory of Joy's career at this point, she had already done a lot of television, she right. did film, um, and she had even been married a few times. I mean, at sure. the, three times, uh, this young age of hers. Mm -hmm. um, and she comes and she sits down next to you. And did you know that Joy was going to be in the film? Uh, I had no idea. I would have been an absolute wreck if I had known that. So I had no idea. I, um, I, I had heard that uh, John Carradine was going to be in it. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, well, whoopee. And, um, and there I am in makeup. Uh, I think it was like at six in the morning, some god awful time. And, and in walks Joy in full makeup, full, I mean, her hair was perfection. She was always perfect. And it was just like, oh, my God. And it just blew me away. And I just sat there like almost in paralysis. And she was so sweet and so charming and just um, not like you would ever expect. I mean, she was just like the sweet girl next door. I mean, not this glamorous woman. And we just hit it off. We became really good friends. 
And again, so, a lot of the questions that I'm going to be asking you are all in the book, but I just want to give everyone a timeline of how this all unfolded and the, you know, and the time frame mm -hmm. of when this was taking place. Right, right. Um, you know, did you know, you know, when you went to Hollywood that you were gay or? Uh, Not initially. I mean, I'd always had crushes on some wonderful uh, friend or teacher or somebody when I was a kid. I mean, I'm, yeah, definitely. And then uh, when I was uh, living, I was living at the studio club in Hollywood where all the actress Farrah Fawcett was there at the same time and Sandy Dunk, Sandy Duncan and oh, I can't remember and Sally Struthers. Oh, wow. And, oh yeah. Really cool people. And uh, at that point, um, well, long story. I had a regular job as a secretary, and uh, the man I worked for must have picked up on something. So he started talking to me about dating Hedy Lamar, and while I had a major <laughs> Oh, there you go. There you go. And, <laughs> and, and, and so he, every day he'd talk about Hedy Lamar and dating her and all this stuff and prime me. I was so ready to meet Hedy Lamar. And it was a setup, and it didn't happen. But I mean, it was all crap. But uh, but uh, that was my first experience, and uh, and then uh, and then I realized who I was, and and it was natural, as you know, Richard. You know that you. I think the expression is you've come home. Well, I I came home. I knew who I was, and. Uh, and, and that, you know, you know, and here we are, you know, and I'll just say this, you know, this past weekend was National Coming Out Day. Yes, yes. And that moment in your life where you realize this is who I am. Yeah. And it's like this for me, you know, this big burden goes off your shoulder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always wondered why I never was, was interested in uh, dating boys in school. I never I, all I wanted to do, I mean, like at the proms or whatever, is I there was a, a girl I had a crush on, and I wanted to dance next to her, and I would drag the poor guy with me. <laughs> it's just, you know, so it I, 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 I'm trying to get the time frame, you know, of 1969. Was it easy for you to be able to tell your close friends and family? No, no, no. no. My parents were. Uh, a very sweet and wonderful, but uh, very old school, and uh, that would not cut it. So I, I never told any of my, I never told my parents ever. Uh, I mean, in fact, the weirdest thing, Richard, is uh, I think I can't remember what year it was, but I was watching TV with my dad, and there was I think the first gay-related uh, TV show or TV movie where there was a a, a gay young man. And I remember my dad saying, my God, I wish, you know, if that were my son, I'd wish you were dead. So guess what? I'm not going to be telling no, anybody. But my no, dad no. ended up being the most compassionate when Joy was ill. He, he was the one who was there for me. So I mean, a lot of people may not realize this, but at that time, even if homosexuality was depicted in a movie, um, there was some demise to the character at the end of the film or something. Oh, oh they was, in every film, they had to kill you off either you uh, like in the fox, they had to hit you with over the head with a tree, <laughs> or or uh, the children's hour, you had to off yourself. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, it was never a happy ending. And now, thank God, there are uh, in films, you know, it's more realistic, and and you actually get to live and live happily ever after. And that's what I had with joy. So, well, you know, I I see this, you know, as I said earlier, and you corroborated this. She was married three times. Yes, yes. Um, she was straight. She was straight. Yeah. But take this, you know, you had that spark. You know, what was it that you were able to pull that out of her? I, whatever it was, I wish I had it again. <laughs> Trust me, you've got it. Oh, God, I'm working on it. But uh, no, the, th the thing that worked for us is communication. I mean, we just like uh, one night after. I mean, it was such a low budget stinko film that we shot hours and hours and hours because I don't think they had the sound <laughs> stage that long. <laughs> so there we are, like I think two or three in the morning, 
and we went to Schwab's uh, on Sunset, mm -hmm. where everybody went. And it was open 24 hours, and we just sat. I mean, she asked me if I wanted to go for coffee, so I said, sure. So we went there, and we just sat and talked and talked all night long. And I love it. It's a thread, you know, it's a thread through, you know, the early part of the relationship and, you know, yeah. to her unfortunate passing, which we'll get to in a few moments. Uh, but the, that the meals were so bonding. <laughs> you know, you, uh, That's all we did. <laughs> you know, when I'm reading this, I feel like I'm there with you. Yeah. You know, at all these dinners and everything. Uh, my husband and I just came back yesterday from Cape Cod. And oh, I'm, how neat. And I'm reading about your trip to Cape Cod and uh, all these incredible trips that you were taking and everything. Um, but, you know, again, we want to go back to that time frame. Uh, mm -hmm. How long was it into the relationship that you ended up uh, moving in with each other? Uh, not very long. <laughs> not very long. The U-Haul, very quickly. Um, <laughs> That that's a gay joke. Everybody out there yeah, who doesn't I know. know, I mean, that's a that's a joke about lesbians. Yeah. What do you do on the second day? Bring the U-Haul. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so no. Uh, I uh, sh well, one night the the fun thing was when I was doing the uh, gig as a go-go dancer in Hollywood, and uh, and I invited her, and she, and she came. And there I am doing uh, doing the go-go dance, and it was like on a platform, and she was seated right in front of me, all decked out, with full makeup, mink coat, looking fine, and and I'm dancing to my girl. That I mean, that was I mean, and and she looked at me and she pulls me down and and she says, "You don't belong here. Let's get out of here." So I bailed. I I just adios, and we went to her house and just sat by the fire and. And I mean, I knew I was gay and I knew that I had this major, major crush on her. I mean, I had fallen in love with her actually. Uh -huh. um, and uh, as, as a person and, um, and I was not, I, I was not going to jeopardize, you know, being her friend by ever letting on that I was gay. I wasn't going to let her know that I wasn't going to do anything. And and we're just lying there talking, and suddenly she reaches over and kisses me. Well, that was the end of it. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. I mean, shocked me out of my mind. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, you're... You're um, idle. You're idle. My, 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 yeah. And she kissed me, and I never left. I never left. Oh, wow. Well, uh, you know, again, seeing her on all these TV shows, you know, I always, I also love that her beauty regimen was Oil of LA. You know, oh, yeah. She, oh, yeah. Um, she had the most flawless skin. She was so stunning. Um, was perfect. What do you think? I, I mean, she, we saw her on all these shows. Uh, I know that there are, I love Lucy fans out there who are watching. Yeah. Today. She was on I Love Lucy. She was on the Bob Cummings show. She was a semi regular, I would call it. I think on she. On the Beverly Hillbillies. How many episodes did she do? I think she did, I'm not sure, four, maybe five. Uh -huh. But, but I mean, she was a standout, and everybody identifies her with the Beverly Hillbillies because it was so great. And then she also did with Kay Ballard uh, on uh, The Mother's in Law. Mm -hmm. That was. One of the last things she did, that and the governor and JJ, which was not a big, you know. But, you know, I remember watching that show. Oh, cool. <laughs> I absolutely cool. watched that. And she came along at a time. Uh, Hollywood was somehow changing. I mean, yes. Marilyn Monroe had come a little earlier than that. And maybe yes. Born and everything. She mm -hmm. had stunning beauty with her. Um, what do you think is the biggest misconception about her? Do you think that her beauty got in the way of her being taken seriously as an actress? I think you're right. I think so. She was actually a very, uh, she was more of a wonderful comedian. She was so funny and, and she would deliver lines deadpan. I mean, um, she, she had a real knack for that. And, um, uh, yeah, people. People were 
more interested in her body than her acting ability, which was really sad. And there's one story that's so painful for me uh, as far as being taken seriously in this business. Mm -hmm. Face it is a cruel business to begin with. Yeah, it is. And that was Elmer Gantry. Can you talk uh, a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, Joy received uh, a contract to work on Elmer Gantry. And uh, she was very excited. This was before me. Most mm -hmm. of this stuff was prior to my knowing her. And um, she went there. She went and they took her back uh, uh, in the back. And uh, there he was. And she says, well, where's the script? Well, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, you, well, no, don't worry about the script. I just wanted you to have you here with me. You know, it was just like, are you serious? And she 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 left. She left immediately. Um, it was so depressing. I mean, and and that's another thing. When when I mean, like when she was ill, and we'd go to doctors trying to find out what was wrong. They were more interested in uh, like one doctor we went to. Uh, he said, "Hold on a second. He brought all of his buddies in just to look at her. You know, and. And it's, oh, nothing's wrong with you. Well, something was very, very wrong with her. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, unfortunately, I think that that contributed to, to her, you know, her uh, undoing. It was awful. I mean, uh, that was the reason for the title of the book, A Body to Die For. Her, mm -hmm. her having a great body and having perfection. She wa she wanted to be perfect. She wanted because there was so much competition. The Monroes and the Mansfield and the Mamie Van Dorans were all out there, and and she was competing with them. And and she still had to audition for everything. Oh my God! Yes. Oh my God! Yes. Oh yeah. And she um. Uh, so she started making her body more toward uh, the direction where people would find her sexier. You know, it had to be sexy and hot and gorgeous, and and that's the book. I mean, she she died for her body; mm -hmm. it killed mm -hmm. her, and uh, and and it breaks my heart. Well, because she was back, so much more. Before we get there, let's go back to your moving in with her, and yes. that okay. time frame in your life, because you uh, came in. You were both blonde. Uh, right. And you pretended to be her sister. Yeah, it worked. Because uh, first of all, if if anyone had suspected that there was some sort of uh, a homosexual relationship between uh, Joy and I, that would have totally killed her career. It was so. Uh, I mean, this was the time of Stonewall. This mm -hmm. was this. I mean, it was illegal. I mean, I mean, not to digress, but I mean, when I first came out. Uh, I went to a bar in L.A., one of the only women's bars at the time. It was called The Mint on Pico, mm -hmm. a real dive, a terrible place. But it was No Touch. I don't know if you're aware of that time, but No Touch. I oh, I know. Hold, I, I, I couldn't hold somebody's hand. Yeah. I couldn't put my hand on their shoulder. I'm not talking sexually. I'm talking just like touching um touching them uh, they could arrest you and they did raid all the time and uh so i mean back to back to uh, the story uh i couldn't do it i mean um uh, so uh we pretended to be sisters we could pull it off because we both were blonde both had the same color eyes i was taller but i mean we could, i was her younger sister rachel oh yeah joy bishop named me rachel he thought that i looked like a rachel so mm -hmm. I became Rachel Lansing. Then so I were married when you arrived. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, you, uh, but um, what was your home life like? Uh, I mean, did she just want to come home and just, just relax and, yeah, yeah. She, you know, behind the scenes? Oh, behind the scenes. She was just like anybody else, you know, uh, she, she didn't get dressed up. She didn't put makeup on. We, you know, when we were at home, all we did was watch the tube or, uh, but we, we went out a lot, as you know, we went to, we, that was our sport. That was mm -hmm. our excitement. We went to lunch 
we went to dinner and uh and that was our life we didn't party uh we didn't hang around a bunch of people because you know it could have been a problem but we were just happy being alone we we didn't need anybody at all we just all we did was talk talk and laugh and dance and just it was the best part of my life it was it was so great richard and as far as her career is concerned yeah. uh and you know, then I want to move on to you know her, the health issues and everything. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the biggest disappointment, career-wise, for her? Uh, the biggest disappointment was when she did "I Love Lucy," you know, and Lucille Ball loved her, could mm -hmm. see in her that she was a wonderful comedian, mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to put her under contract. She wanted to to feature her in her own series. And uh, at that time, Joy was married to uh, a guy by the name of Stan who was, who was in my life with her. And um, uh, they were legally separated when we met. They were married in 60 and separated in 65. And I met Joy in 69. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to be her manager. So Joy was just, you know, okay. And so Stan tried to be her manager and he had a major ego. And when the contract came in, he said, you're not taking this. You're too good for this. And killed it. Absolutely killed it. That's I mean, what managers are good for. Aren't they great? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, just terrible. Yeah. And, just I mean, that was her major problem was she dated the, her managers all of them, uh, pretty much. And, uh, you know, uh, there was always ego and jealousy and stuff that got involved instead of uh, uh, having her be the number one important thing. So um, was it a, a, a struggle for her to conform to being what Hollywood wanted her to be? Uh, I know that in her bio and everything, that even though that she was born into a Mormon household, she was not a practicing Mormon. No, she and wasn't. And that was the image that they put out in Hollywood. Sure. Yeah. Well, the studios. Yeah. The studios wanted her. They wanted her to be the uh, the good girl next door who didn't smoke or drink and was a nice little Mormon girl. Well, uh, she didn't smoke mm -hmm. and she wasn't Mormon. Uh, uh, so, but, but, you know, a lot of people identified her, you know, as that, as that sweet little girl instead of just the sex pot and it, well, the sexy good girl. So not trashy. So, um, and uh, you know, there's, I can talk about this because I grew my father was an alcoholic and mm -hmm. I she struggled also with alcohol. When right. did that all begin to be consuming with her or did it consume her? No, it didn't. It, it, this, I think my gut feeling Richard is, uh, she, she well she had cancer and i think that uh, of her breast and ovaries and i think that uh, she had a hormonal problem mm -hmm. and it seemed as though she would have like it happened almost every month suddenly she would get depressed and she would order some scotch from uh, john and pete's down the street and they would deliver it and then she, and she had a problem with sleeping pills she was second all and two and all and all that terrible stuff uh, because you know it, it boils back to all the studio stuff you know give them the downers to go to sleep give them the uppers to you know so she she was hung up on uh on downers on sleeping pills mm -hmm. and so she would mix the scotch with the second all and then she would get totally blasted and uh, I mean, it was really difficult. I was 21. I didn't understand. I didn't know from pills. I didn't know from alcohol. I didn't know any of that stuff. But I learned. I learned how mm -hmm. to take care of her. And uh, I mean, they didn't have the things like they do now where you go into rehab mm -hmm. or you go goes get therapy. No, this was all, un, you know, there was always an undercurrent. Uh, and so I took care of her when she would mm -hmm. do this. I would make sure she didn't 
die. I mean, I would find her pills and uh, take out some of the second all and put some gelatin in it or something. Wow. Just so, you know, I became very, very uh, aware on about caring for her. You know, I mean, if it were now, I would do a whole different thing. But at that point, that's all I knew. And, and I just wanted her to be alive. Of course. So, of so, course. But uh, and again, a lot of these things that I'm going to ask you now are covered in the book, but just uh -huh. to move us along with this story. Um, tell us how the surgeries began and uh -huh. where it started becoming, because it was almost as if they were molding her to be, you know, something that she wasn't. Yeah. Uh, well, she had silicone injections. Uh, it was illegal. It's still illegal. Um, and how, uh, how did that begin when, you know, and how she found the doctors and yeah, I don't, I, she never told me exactly who introduced her to these doctors, but there was one in LA that did it and one in New York. And, um, and she went through with Sinatra. She, Sinatra had it in his face. Mm -hmm. And as, as he got older, you could see that his face was a little lumpy. Well, that was a silicone, and Joy had it in her breasts, and 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 I mean it's instantaneous. You start getting bigger and bigger, and and then she got bigger and bigger. And, and oh, I, I got to tell you something so funny. Um, I saw a magazine article with her holding these little dumbbells, and it's how I increase my bust. So. You know, just doing exercises, and I, people bought it because they didn't know about the. Well, again, it was that, that whole p uh, publicity machine that was going on. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, so people thought that that was uh, that's how she did it, and she just got bigger and bigger, and she was like a dull D. She was large, mm -hmm. and and that became her image. You know, the blonde bombshell with the with the big chest, and. Uh, and she just kept getting more and more silicone injections. I mean, she stopped, and then she had problems with it. As, as I, I uh, what happened the physically with her when, she, when, uh, what was the period between her last injection and the next one? And what was happening physically to her body during that time? Okay, when I met her, she, she had long stopped. I think she stopped the injections probably around sixty-five, right around there, maybe a maybe a little bit later. And when I met her, she was having problems with one of her breasts. It became hard. It became hard and misshapen. And uh, she just said, well, I fell. And that's probably what did it. And, 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 you know, we went to see a couple of doctors about it. Um, and there wasn't the knowledge at that time about breast cancer. No, no, no. And nobody knew about silicone. They didn't have, they really, they may have started doing a few implants at that time, but it was, you know, just a rarity. You know, if, if someone wanted augmentation, they, they had the silicone. Mm -hmm. So, um, so she did that and uh, that was the beginning of the end. I mean, that's, I think what uh, actually uh, caused her death. That and uh, she's, uh, she went to a, do a doctor friend um, and said to him, uh, I don't want to grow old. And what can I do? And so he gave her an open-ended prescription. For, and I want to let everyone know at this point in her life, she's in her early 40s. Uh, th actually, uh, this, doc yeah, this doctor gave it to her when she was in her 30s. Uh, uh, he, he gave her estrogen. He gave her a prescription for estrogen and never told her to stop taking it a few days or whatever. And she just kept doing this. So I think the, the estrogen and the silicone, because it caused cellular changes in, in her body, I think that that's what uh, caused her death. I mean, she was only 43, Richard, and it was just know, so awful. And, you know, and again, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, you know, that yeah. we're this conversation right now. Yeah. Uh, as she started, what physically was happening with her body, you know, from the moment that she realized the hardness 
of what she was dealing with and how did the two how did this affect the two of you moving forward uh well she she had to disguise the fact that her breast was misshapen when she would wear uh uh low cut gowns and stuff she'd have to pad that so she just thought it was just sort of a, like a technical problem, not a physical problem. You know, she wanted to uh, see if there was something she could do about it, but it wasn't on, you know, that wasn't her uh, main focus. It was just hiding that little issue. Uh, and I didn't know anything. I mean, I was just, I was so green, Richard. I was so so naive and I didn't know any. I wish I didn't say more. the word that you were about to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I because, was, no, you I, weren't. I was, yeah, and <laughs> and um, so you know that that was basically what the deal was. And at this point, in her, her when I met her, she, her career was sort of waning because there weren't many parts for blonde bombshells. Uh, they they were sort of uh, getting away from that. And I mean, and, let, you know, put this in perspective for everyone. I mean, Raquel Welch was hitting the screen. Oh, sure. They done away. Oh yeah. Uh, it was a whole different look as right. far as the sex pot in Hollywood. Right. Yeah. The blonde bombshell was becoming passe, and luckily, Joy happened to be a wonderful singer. Uh, I don't know if you know that. Oh, yeah. She, oh, yeah. She had a great nightclub act. And, I mean, she got tremendous reviews because she was so good. And that's what we did. Uh, because, I mean, to, to keep her career going, is, is I mean, uh, we were on the road doing uh, a nightclub acts. And then she did theater in the round on Long Island, which mm -hmm. was great fun. We did that. We went to New York, and that was exciting. I mean, I... Mm -hmm. 21 22 wow you know and and then vegas vegas was a blast did she ever feel um at this point you know i, I mean she's dealing also with the illness and everything but did she yeah. ever feel that she would not have a career beyond hollywood did she ever pursue no mentioned the theater work did she ever pursue that as a career no no i mean um she lived in now Mm -hmm. not in the future. And uh, actually, she didn't actually become ill until we were together probably about a year. And then she started having problems. And then it was discovered. Uh, and then even after that, she still appeared, you know, nightclub gigs. And then, um, and, and, and uh, we just, coped with it we just coped well did you, know? you have a sense of hope at this point or did you feel that the ending was ahead of you i had the weirdest freakiest thing when we were in new york uh i saw a billboard about some funeral home or something and it just it's just like it just whacked me in the head i just thought oh no you know that it i don't know it was just foretelling to me um um, and then when it was discovered, uh, uh, the doctor told me, took me aside and said, uh, I mean, she has cancer and it's everywhere. It's, just, mm -hmm. it's it. This is it. And luckily they had tried different chemos with her. I mean, when she was in the hospital having, she had an ovarian tumor the size of a football oh and, oh yeah. And they removed it and they just shut her closed her up and they, and they came out and told me there's nothing they can do but and they didn't think she would ever leave the hospital and she how was that relationship was this i know that you had four years together yeah uh, this was just a little after a year and um and uh, they tried different chemos and she left and she felt great that was the miracle richard she felt great mm -hmm. she she wasn't in a lot of pain. She didn't lose her hair. I mean, I mean, she was on some pretty heavy chemo. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, her hair thinned, and she wore hair pieces. But she, she, it didn't all fall out, which was a blessing for her because she was so insecure. That's one thing. She was very insecure about her looks. Now, and I want I want to talk a little bit about the book and um, when 
was when did you make the decision that you wanted to tell this story? Ah, uh, the deciding okay. factor. Uh, yeah, I was never going to write a book. I was never going to do anything. Um, and I was having some physical problems around 2008. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I had uh, reconnected with Joy's stepdaughter, Leslie, who was very dear. We, uh, we hadn't seen each other since Joy died. And, you know, I, I, when you're ill um, and bored, I, at least I do, I get on the phone and I'm just finding everybody I ever knew That's and want to talk. That's oh, sure, I'm, I'm on the phone. So I'm yakking away. And then I contacted her and, and we rekindled our friendship and she was wonderful she was just a very good friend and and she says well what you know and i didn't know she knew about our relationship because we kept this on the down low you know we never you know the only one who knew was joy's brother her 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 half brother larry he knew uh but uh i didn't know and she kept saying to me every day she'd say uh, why don't you write a book? I said, what about? She says, well, why don't you write a book about joy? And I go, and I kept thinking, what the heck am I going to write about? You know, we had lunch. <laughs> well, I did that anyway. <laughs> I did that anyway. So, that's throughout the book. <laughs> that's, that's part of it. Yeah. And I says, and I said, and I, this went on for months. You, you know, uh, you got to write a book. And, and finally, it just, it was just like, okay. Okay, Leslie. Leslie, did you, and I finally just, I had it because I, I didn't want to hear it anymore because I wasn't going to do anything. And she says, well, well, are you going to write the book? And I said, Leslie, do you understand what kind of relationship Joy and I had? And she says, yeah, you were lovers. And I just about had, I just about oh fainted. Uh, and I said, what? <laughs> and she, and I said, how did you know that? She says, well, Joy told me she was so excited and so happy about it. And that must I have knew. made your heart jump out of your Oh you know? my god. Oh my god. So I wrote the book. <laughs> had you ever written before? Did you no, 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 I I've written detail in the book are phenomenal. So okay, thank I, I you. thought you know that you had kept uh journals. What did you learn about yourself writing the book? Um I learned that I was living living in the past a lot um well the, the i i think you can understand this i didn't i joy was my great love and i didn't want to lose one moment with her so i when you know someone's gonna die you, i i just hung on to every memory and i just clocked it and clocked it and so after she was gone, I ran these tapes in my head all the time. Just, I was just living, I was still living with joy in my mind. And what was important for me to progress, to, to, to actually live again, was when I put all these memories down in the book, I was able, I was free. I was, I, and I would never lose. See, that was what I was afraid of, was losing those memories. And I didn't, you know, because it's in the book. Did you have any trepidations at all about, um, for lack of a better term, forgive me, of outing her with this book? Um, I thought about it. And I talked to Leslie about it. Uh, because I was, I didn't want to hurt anybody. I did not want to hurt Leslie. I didn't want to hurt her family, her daughters, who are producers. I, I, I didn't want to do any of that. So she says, no, you know, fine. And I talked to various people. Uh, and the thing is, it's not a tell-all, no, Richard, as you, as you know. I it's know. a love story. It's a love story. And it's a cautionary tale. It's uh, appearances are lovely but they're not everything. They're not everything. Uh, and what was your process in terms of writing the book? Did you write it in a linear fashion? Yes. Or, okay. Yes, I did. Uh, I dedicated every day. I dedicated from eight o'clock at night till four in the morning. That's when I wrote, because mm -hmm. the phone wasn't going to ring. 
uh, there were no distractions and I could just really concentrate and, and go with my thoughts. And I would write like 10 pages a night. And then I'd send them to Leslie to see how she felt about it. You know, if anything bothered her and it didn't. So that's, that's how it progressed. And did and, anyone else read the book besides oh, Leslie before it was? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I, I, I had a, a, my little cross section of people. I had a minister read it to see if it would irritate some people. Uh, I had a nurse read it. I had a couple of other people and they all approved. They didn't find it offensive because I, first of all, joy was so important to me. I, I would not want to associate it's your story. It's yeah, not, I, this is your yeah, story. It's my story. And I, I didn't want, anyone to associate something offensive with her. Uh, I want her reputation to be good. And I'm, I didn't make it salacious. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's a love story, as you know, Richard. And, oh, and it's, and it's to tell people, please. I mean, I'm, I'm crying reading this book. It's just, oh, so, you know, no, and um, I, you know, it was just such it, it, what you uh, chose to tell and how do you edit yourself when you're writing a book such as this? Because for me, your book is very much like um, peeling an onion. It there was. are so many layers to this story. Mm -hmm. There's the love story, and then there's the health issues, and right. the, the background of Hollywood at that time. Right. The world that we were living in at that time. And it just like piles one on top of the other. Sure. And you do it so seamlessly. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. I also had a really good editor, <laughs> which helps uh, because I could be a little redundant. <laughs> so they cleaned it up. And um, I'm very grateful for that and, um, and, and kept the continuity going. And it was, it was just, uh, it was uh, chronological, you mm -hmm. know, it was just like when we met until the very end. Um, and I tried to, I tried to make it so that it was easily read, you know, I, because I can't stand uh, long chapters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the patience. I don't have, because usually oh, I, if, I read, don't days. if I read, I read at night, right? And, and, I, and they're blurry. I'm thinking, oh, God. And I'll check to see how many more pages in this chapter. And if it's any more than like 10, I go, I'll forget it. So I kept the chapters short. And, um, and then I also tried to make it so that, um, uh, it wasn't a downer. I don't want people to pick it up thinking that it's a total downer. Sure. Yeah. There's some sadness. Uh, and was this an easy book to sell or did you write the book and then sell it or, uh, you know, which well, came first, the well, chicken or the egg? Um, I was in the process of writing it and I talked to a friend who turned me on to uh, 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 Bear Manor Media mm -hmm. uh, and, and they primarily do uh, entertainment related books. And I, and I talked to Ben and I told him about the book and he had a, he had a crush on joy. He loved joy. So he says, <laughs> whatever it is, I'll publish it. So I, I mean, I was, I, I'm one of those lucky people that had a publisher before I was even, and I'm, Nobody knows me, so um, I mean, I did really you like deadline, that. or did you have the no, no, whatever? And um, then I it went through the process of having it edited and re edited, and then he took it and re edited, it and and then it came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, it has been a wonderful response to the book, Richard. I, I I'm in awe. I mean, ah, oh, people love the book. I mean, the reviews blow my mind. I mean, I'm thrilled. And at what point did you know that the book was ready to be, you know, processed by the masses? Um, as soon as I was finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's a know. good point. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Just uh, well, I guess then and there, you know, as soon as it as soon as it was edited, uh, I was ready to ready to go, and um, and then uh, it came out. Uh, I think it was June of 2015. And after um, you finished the book, did it take for it to come out? It, well, I finished it in 2008. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, it's, it just took time to time for editing and all that good stuff and re-editing and, you know, uh, you know, just changes just so well, obviously, you, know, you know, going full circle, yeah. uh, you came to Hollywood for a career right. and you, this is not the career that you thought that you would have. No. What was the thing that surprised you the most after the book came out? The response blew me away, Richard. I mean, the first, my first review was a five-star review. I thought, whoa, this is. And just to I mean, let everyone know, if you Google, you'll see lots of five-star reviews. Yeah, it's amazing. It blows me away, Richard. I mean, uh, I, I'm in awe. I'm thrilled that people love it and it touches people's hearts. That's what I wanted it to do. I want people to realize that, you know, that, that trite saying love is love. Well, love is love. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, you know, and I loved her and she loved me. And it was, uh, it was a great relationship. It doesn't matter which gender, you know, um, and I was there for her and, um, and very devoted to her. And I was, I was the lucky one, Richard. I had her in my life. And what do you hope most that people come away with after reading this story? <sighs> to be kind and compassionate to each other, to love each other. Um, Cause that's really what all, what, that's all there is really. Um, and to love with all your heart, but not just Mickey Mouse, just really, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be willing to be vulnerable, willing to take a chance. I mean, if, I mean, uh, it's hard to express. It's mm -hmm. just, um, well, you have expressed it. Oh, and I want to ask how, what's going on in your life now? Uh, in terms of relationship, your work, any, where are you now with everything? Right now, right now, I am, uh, I'm, an, I'm also an artist and I paint and I'm also doing jewelry, which is my new passion. I I'm saw doing that. Jewelry. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I, I'm on Etsy, Alexis mm -hmm. Hunter Jewels, and uh, I'm, I'm loving that. I love being creative. That, that, it gives me life. I, uh, you know, if I'm not creative, I, it just, it, it's not good. So I'm, I've been doing that and I'm hoping anybody out there, I want this to be a film. I want Joy's story to be a film. Is there anyone in particular that you could imagine playing her? Um, a couple of people. At first I thought Charlize. Oh, wow. She's so beautiful. Yes, I mean, that's true. She's beautiful. And uh, I think she could play anybody because there's great dimension in the book. I mean, it goes, I mean, there's so many aspects, so many facets to joy. And it, has it been shipped? I mean, uh, shopped around as a. No, no, because what, what's unfortunate right now, uh, it's not like the old days where a producer or the studio would find a book and, and they'd have their team mm -hmm. do the screenplay. Well, now they want the author to provide it. Well, I'm not a screenwriter, and I need I need a screenplay. Well, Alexis, you weren't a writer before you wrote the book. I know, but <laughs> <laughs> times uh, times a ticket on, babe. <laughs> so you know, I would like this done within a certain amount of time. You know, mm. I would like to be able to see the film. So you know that that's my hope. And I've spoken with a couple of people and, you know, if I can get the screenplay going, I think there's interest. So, because I think the timing is perfect. I, I mean, think it's an important story that needs to be told on so many yeah. levels. Oh yeah. And, um, oh, I, I don't know if I told you, uh, there was a local high school that has had my book in their curriculum for their, uh, yeah. Is that the best for their, um, uh, baccalaureate students. They're, wow. they're wonderful students. And uh, they read my book uh, along with an, another great novel. And then they would do uh, an essay on it. And I got to read the essays that they all wrote. And it just touched me because all these kids 
uh, from very different backgrounds, there was no animosity, no no weirdness about it. They all accepted it, and they accepted it as love. You know, that's what I want. I that's my takeaway that this is a love story. You know, and 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 if you and one thing that's happened that really touches me is I've had parents get in touch with me and say. Um, well, I found out my, my son was gay, and after somebody turned me on to your book and I'm reading it, uh, we're now talking. They weren't talking. So now there's understanding and love, and that's what I want. I want that more than anything, Richard. That's wonderful. Well, I can't believe this, but we are already at the end of our interview. Oh, no. Uh, no, this hour flew oh, by. No. We've been waiting so long to do this. Um, I, I want to say a few things before we sign off. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. You're such a light, and this has been a thrill for me. Um, oh. I uh, hope that you all enjoyed today's interview. And if you did, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show. That helps to book me in other markets. Um, mm -hmm. I also tell everyone to end every show by going out and doing something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. So what I would like you all to do today is go to your Facebook friends list, go to the fourth name that pops up, and I want you to uh, order this book and I want you to send the book to your fourth friend on Facebook. So you can learn about Joy Lansing and this wonderful love story. And, uh, and I also want to uh, say that to, uh, my next show will be on Thursday night at 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific time. And it's Creativity in the Age of COVID with Dr. Judy Bloom, and my guest will be Karen Mason, Harold Saniton, and Reverend Sean Moniger, talking about what they're doing to keep everything flowing through this age. And before we sign off, I'm gonna give you the last word. Uh, anything you wanna to say to everyone who's uh, watching, either about joy, where you are in your life, or a message that you would like to leave for everyone before we sign off today. I would love everyone to remember Joy, to uh, Google her name, to find out more about her, because that's the most important thing to me is to keep her memory alive. That's number one, and to love each other. That's, that's, that's where it's at. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I love you. You're the best. I love you too, Richard. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, it was such an honor. Thank, oh, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. you. And remember, to get the book, order it for your fourth friend. I'm going to do the same thing right now. Thank I you. love you. Thank you, Richard. I'll see you on Thursday. Yay.